You are sitting in the podcast equipment and tools session. Uh, hopefully by the end of this, you're gonna know everything that you need for getting started, getting launched, why it matters, the right questions to ask, all of that. So I want to start with a story of a farmhouse table. This is something, this isn't mine in particular, but it's one that's very, very similar to the design I made. Um, built it with my family probably two years ago and got the, got the initial design from this website. I think it's Anna, Anna White. Um, she's this really awesome woodworker, I think out of Alaska. And went through the whole process of building it. And after a couple seasons of living in Michigan with the, the breathing of the table and the wood and everything, the top began to crack. And now for me, I'm kind of a perfectionist, so it drove me insane. I'm like, why is this table so messed up? And my wife's like, it adds character. So I'm glad she likes it, but it, it pisses me off to no end. And after going back and looking at the design, I, I saw that she recently updated her design. And so anybody that does woodworking, um, this was one of my first like larger endeavors. I grew up in a home where my dad did everything. Like he'd pay somebody to do it once and watch them and then he would figure out how to do it. And so the initial design, you had to take all the boards across the top and then you had like these giant wood clamps to sort of squeeze them together. And then it was just like quarter inch beams that were underneath and then you were drilling up through the bottom and into it. And as I was putting it together, I kind of had this intuitive feeling. I'm like, I don't think this is the best way to go about it. And when they ended up redoing the, the plans of how to create this, it's actually these other ones called like pocket joints. And it's when you lay all the boards next to each other and then you drill into them sideways. And so the, like each board as it's laying drills into itself and it keeps it nice and tight and it will last longer than the, the current design that I have. Now, the reason I bring this up is because there's not a single white, right way to do this. Clearly, I built it one way, it's all right. There's another way that I wish I would have built it like, and that worked out a little bit better. The second thing is that because I didn't have the experience I needed up front, it, it left me at a bit of a disadvantage opposed to somebody that's been doing it for a long time. And so podcasting is very much the same way. And you're gonna hear me repeat this a few times. I'm going through a variety of technical aspects of this, the tools that I'm using, the equipment that I'm using, the software that I'm using. But let me be the first one in the room to say there is no right answer. I don't care that Joe Rogan is using a specific type of microphone or that maybe you want to get the exact same sound as this other person, Tim Ferriss or whoever it might be. Different situations will have different right answers. And so I've been doing this for a while, um, but there's, there's a lot of ways that we can go about it. So from this entire session, we're gonna be covering three things. You're gonna walk out of here with three different things. The first is what are the right questions to ask if you wanna start a podcast, or maybe you're in the planning phases already. What are those right questions? The second thing is I'm gonna give a, a pretty solid overview of the recording equipment that you may want to use. There's no way that I can get through everything that's gonna be helpful or that you might possibly use, but I'm gonna at least kinda of walk you through my own setup. And then I'm gonna talk about the tools that I use for everything else. So project management and all those kind of things, communication, what have you. Now, first, I think it's important to establish why podcasting matters. Um, just a, a quick show of hands. How many of you already have a podcast? Okay, a few people, a few people. And then it sounds like the rest of us are probably interested for one of these next few reasons. First of all, people are listening and a lot of people. It's beginning to grow tremendously. If we're looking at the numbers, uh, there's a, a study that comes out from Edison Research and Triton Digital, and they've been producing this for quite a while now. Almost 125 million Americans have listened to a podcast, and over 70 million Americans listen monthly, and nearly 50 million listen weekly. When you break this down on a consistency level, we've seen positive growth Almost since 2005, um, we've definitely, there was one tiny dip from 2012 to 2013, but otherwise we've seen positive growth of 10 to 20% every single year outside of the one year that I just mentioned. And so a lot of people will talk about these things like, oh, this is a fad or, or whatever it might be. And I'm going to argue that it isn't. 
It's not. We've seen consistent, dependable growth in terms of this particular medium. It's not the next hot social media. It's another entirely different way that we're consuming information and one that's a lot easier than, say, some of these other ones. So first, um, one of the big things that I pay attention to is audio's unfair advantage. There's a book called uh, Zero to One, and it's by Peter Thiel. And he talks about a lot of his different like, philosophies when it comes to starting a business and entrepreneurship. And he talks one in particular where it's how we underestimate our competition. And it's, the, it's either the scale of competition or the competition of scale. I forget what, what the order of the phrasing is. But essentially, so for example, we, I had a client at one point when I was doing web development work who had a, a specialty bakery. And she only thought her real competition were other specialty bakeries. But what Teal would make an argument for is that anyone else selling food at breakfast time was her competition. So now when I take that principle and I look at it from a consuming content, if we're out there, we're pushing out blogs or articles or whatever it might be, a blog post demands attention from your eyes. And so you might think if you're in a specialty niche, maybe you do designer shoes or maybe you have like homemade goods or whatever it might be. You might only think that other designer shoe blogs are your competition. But I'm gonna argue that all other blogs are your competition along with physical books, along with the latest Hulu or Netflix series, or YouTube videos of silly cats doing ridiculous things, or going outside to play with your children. There's a ton of things that demand the attention of our eyes. But when you look at audio specifically, audio is the one medium that you can listen to while doing something else. For most of us, if we're listening to a podcast, it's while we're on the way or coming home from work. It might be while we're working out or doing the dishes or some yard work or whatever it might be. And when you start to look at it from that angle, the only other real competition for that particular platform would be other audio. So you have things like other podcasts, audiobooks, and music. And when you scaffold it in that way, or when you sort of organize it in that way, all of a sudden it becomes a lot more interesting to see that you have a huge potential to reach people that otherwise you're gonna have a lot more barriers if you were going a visual route. Another reason that people might want a podcast and why it's important is that you can build authority through association. So this is just uh, the cover art of my podcast, and you're going to notice several of these people are here. These are people in the WordPress community that I've happened to interview. We have Carrie Dills, Sarah Dunn's here, Joe's here, Kyle's here, Chris is here. And my hope is, because these people are awesome, and they were on my show, by default, you're going to think I'm awesome. <laughs> and so it's this proximity that I'm talking to these experts in these different niches, and after a while, you build this association that, wow, Jeff must be cool because he's talking to really cool people. And so that's something that we might want to do if we want to become a leader of an industry or a particular niche or whatever it might be. Other stuff, uh, kind of in the same vein, is the networking and referrals that you're able to receive from podcasting. So if you host a podcast, actually, let me back up. Let's say you don't host a podcast, but you have somebody in whatever industry you happen to be working in that you really, really look up to. So for example, for me, I, I like content creation. I'm a big fan of copy hackers. And Joanna Weeb is the, the main person behind them. Now, if I would have just emailed her and been like, hey, Joanna, can I talk to you for an hour? Because I think you're cool. <laughs> like, the, the likelihood of her getting a hold of me is, is not very good. But the fact that I emailed her and I'm like, hey, Joanna, I have a podcast. Or I'd love to feature your work. Want to talk? And then she was like, yeah, that'd be great. So we have, uh, I'm going to call her out. We have an all-star. Sarah, I just had you on my last slide as one of the cool, popular people I hung out with. So, see, she just walked in and the room just got cooler. So anyways, with this networking thing, you all of a sudden have an excuse to talk to people that otherwise are untouchable. And then beyond that, you start getting referrals. I had uh, a podcast for a while ago now when I was running a board game publishing company with uh, some friends of mine. And we interviewed, we were basically doing interviews on the business of board games. So how did a board game actually get created? We looked at design, we looked at manufacturing, we looked at all the aspects of it. We had a listener out of Cape Town, South Africa, who became, uh, became a big a fan of ours. And it turns out he's been running his own presentation company. He basically teaches CEOs how not to suck at public speaking. He's been doing it for 20 years or so, and we became pretty good friends out of it. 
from him in Cape Town. I have a small network developing now, and it's not, I'm not saying this to make it about me, but through Rich, I met my business coach. Through him, I just interviewed a gentleman the other day who's a cryptocurrency expert, and he's created platforms that are like as big as and similar to Mint. He's gonna be the episode that launches on Monday. From him, Simon, the gentleman that I just interviewed, he's gonna be putting, hopefully, in contact uh, with the gentleman that created Ghost, which is another CMS. So I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about other CMSs at the WordPress conference, but it's another pretty major CMS, and he's the founder of that company, and it's just through simply networking, through having this podcast as a medium that I can talk to new people, all of a sudden I'm getting put in contact with just amazing people left and right. And probably the biggest thing for me is that you get to learn something new. When you host, you can both teach and learn all the time. Like, it's ridiculous. And, and you'll see in a second, I, we produce them. My agency produces podcasts. So I have one that, uh, one that we create for a real estate person, a person that works in the real estate space. And he interviews these high-end real estate people on a regular basis. Like, it, all, it, a lot of the guys, it, gentlemen, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, don't remember their names off the top of my head per se, but people responsible for like the Chicago skyline and these major buildings in Philadelphia and people that have built internationally. And the amount of information that I'm just learning as we're working with him, the stuff that I learned from my own guests, it's ridiculous. And so if you want to get a quick, hard, fast education, start interviewing experts in, a, in whatever area it is you're interested in. The other thing that we should probably understand is how this works. And so some of us might not know yet, and it's sort of a, it can be a nebulous idea of how does the whole podcast structure work and how is it set up. For us, for my agency, we break it down into basically four pieces. The first part is the planning. And like any good content, I take, um, a lot of, I take a lot of nods from, say someone like Andy Crestadina runs Orbit Media out of Chicago. Uh, Joanna Weeb's another person that I mentioned a minute ago, and they'll do a lot of research up front. And so it's a matter of what is the goal of the podcast? What, um, who is your target audience? What is it that is trying to accomplish? How are you going to accomplish that? Doing all that legwork up front, because when you begin to research something, it's really easy to just wake up and say, oh, I have a good idea. I'm going to write about it, or I'm going to blog about it, or I'm going to podcast about it. And then you post it, and then you're like, why is no one reading this? And it's, it's because you didn't do the legwork up front. If you start researching and you see what people are already looking for, it's much easier to drive uh, users and, and consumers to that content. And so we're doing a lot of planning up front of how we're going to execute this cast, along with other things like what format should it be? Would it be better to be a story-based one? Should it be interview? Should it be a solo person? Uh, a lot of things come into that up front. Second is the part that most people are familiar with, the actual production aspects. That's like, what equipment do I need? How do I use said equipment? Um, what are we doing from the editing process? How do I make it sound as good as these other podcasts I listen to, or as good as radio, or even better? And getting it out there, where am I putting it? Once I'm done, once I have this MP3 file, where does it go? The third part is the actual promotion piece. And so that's finding a home for it on the internet. That's how am I getting it out to the people that I want to hear it, and all of those aspects. And then the final piece, if you're, if you're really kind of thinking it through, is tracking the progress. And so looking at how, are, how did we define success in the beginning, and are we doing that? What is it that we need to pay attention to? Is it listens? Is it downloads? Is it um, site traffic? Is it click-throughs on email that we're sending out regarding the podcast? There's a lot of ways that you can define success, but it's, it's paying attention to these four aspects are sort of holistically what we need to look for when we're building a podcast. And so again, this is kind of a, a, just a quick rundown. You're the person with the idea. Maybe you like books. And you're going to do your planning. You'll get the recording done. You're going to edit those episodes, and then you're going to publish those episodes. It might be on a podcast platform like YouTube or SoundCloud or Stitcher or Google Play or Spotify, whatever. You'll probably have a website where it lives as well. And then that's where the person, the listener, is able to find it and go, hey, I like books too. I want to learn about this podcast. And so this is just like a really simplified version of the process and how it works. And like I said in the beginning, when you start to look for these things, when you start to try to figure it out, it can be incredibly overwhelming. 
Um, for me personally, I have a background in music anyways. I was a musician before, I mean, I think it was almost my musicianship that started to turn me on to the idea of entrepreneur to begin with. So I have about 15 years worth of audio experience. And then I ran um, our company, Come Alive Creative, for about five years now, where I used to be a teacher and I resigned from teaching, started Come Alive Creative. We started as just a, a sort of generalist web dev shop, played around with some different niches like e-commerce and things, but it was about partway, we've had about a solid year now, we're partway through last year, um, one of the services that we were providing was podcast production. And I just got to a point where I'm like, I don't want to do websites anymore. There was a lot about it that I, I didn't care for, and I really, really love audio. And for a lot of the reasons that I listed in the beginning, I just think it's such a wonderful medium to solve people's problems. And so I said, okay, we're going to gut everything. And we, we killed all our other services, and the only thing we're doing now is podcasting. And so I'm able to look at it a little broader than just walking into it. Whereas, I can give you an example of a podcast that I recently was on. Um, the, the gentleman sent me the audio back of the episode, and there's humongous discrepancies in terms of the quality. My volume's super, super low. His volume's really high. It'd be very difficult for anybody trying to listen to it, and I, it had to spark this conversation. And the point is, he started telling me about, well, I watched this YouTube video on it, and this is what it said to do. And I'm like, oh, let's start there. Like, let's start to figure this out. So it can be very overwhelming to try to jump into something new. Um, but as long as you find the right sources and the right resources, it's a, a good bet. Like, you can go for it. So, so don't get overwhelmed by that. It doesn't have to be as complicated as it may seem as you're coming across this information. And so like you see on the slide, I run Come Alive Creative. Um, Come Alive Creative is an agency. We produce podcasts usually for professionals and for businesses. Come Alive Academy is the education portion of things. That's getting revamped. Um, if you go there, uh, you might see some major changes over the next month or so as I continue to improve it. I just was at Norcross's uh, GDPR talk and I'm freaked out about selling anything online to people, so <laughs> that's a little nerve wracking. And then my personal site, I talk a lot about uh, just the kind of the things that I find interesting within business and, and what I'm learning personally, and that's the home of my podcast. Um, beyond that, we produce a lot. Um, we can see we have two internal casts where it's mine. The, the branding of it's like, it's just me. It's my sandbox, and I get to interview really, really awesome people. So that's been great. Podcast Bites is a good one for if you want to just answer a single question about how to podcast. And then otherwise, a lot of those other ones that you see are clients of ours, people that we've worked with and that we've helped produce. So the first question. This is the, I told you you were going to learn three things. The first thing, the first question you want to ask when you're starting is what is your budget? I'm going to repeat this over and over. There is no right answer. You might have a budget of nothing. You might have a budget of several thousand dollars. It doesn't matter. Just know what that budget is. The second question that you really need to understand before beginning is where are you recording? Are you in a studio? Are you going to be stationary? Is it going to be in one place all the time? Are you going to record in the field? Do you need to get those B-roll sounds of the car engine starting or people talking at a coffee house, the sound of the rain on the sidewalk? Maybe you're telling a story that those things are necessary. And depending on where you are, and may, heck, heck, maybe you're both. Maybe you have opportunities for both locations. A lot of that will determine what equipment you need depending on where you are. And the last one is how many people will be on your podcast. So do you have a co-host? Is it just you? Are you doing just a monologue style thing? Are you interviewing people? Are you interviewing people live? Are you interviewing people remote? All of these things play a factor in what you need in order to pull off your podcast. So you have to have answers to those three things. Those are three like hands down questions I ask right off the bat uh, when I'm talking to new people. So now this, this leads us to the equipment. Um, one of the things that I've learned is the more you learn about something, the more you realize you don't know is, is what it comes down to. And it's funny, like uh, part of a, the conversation that I said is coming out on Monday. Um, I don't remember the quote exactly, but it was really good. And he was talking about how I considered him an expert in crypto. And so everybody's really, especially December before everything exploded, Bitcoin was going like gangbusters at 18,000 a coin and all this other stuff. And a lot of people have sort of jumped on the bandwagon and said like, oh, I, I know all about crypto. 
Well, this gentleman in particular, he's been working in it since it was a dollar in 2011, and he's been building software and, and apps and all these things to work with it. And he was telling me, he's like, I just learn more and more how little I know. Like the more that he knows, you listen to him, like you'd just be dumbfounded in the amount of information he has. But he was very humble about it in the sense of like, there's so much to learn. Equipment is changing all the time. I have a, a post that I've put out there that I wrote originally in 2015 that is, I need, I've already updated it on my site and on the guest site that I've, I've uh, wrote it originally on, I need to send them to my updated copy because anybody that reads it would say I was an idiot <laughs> at this point based on the stuff that I was previously recommending. And so these things completely vary. These are just some personal preferences. It's stuff that I've used. I think that it's good, but it is not the gold standard by any means. You've got to figure out what works best for you. So first, to mention the free. Free exists. If you want to record a podcast and you have one of these, go for it. There's apps like Anchor that allow you to just record right out of the gate. You don't need anything else outside of your phone. But I'm going to give you a caveat. There are definitely things um, with just like any software services that we use when they're free, there's going to be some downsides. One, quality will be an issue. If you're recording from your phone, it will work. And maybe that's all you need right now to even just see if you like it. But your audio quality will not sound as good as Serial or anything from NPR or Startup or any of those that you're hearing. Like that's professionally done, full teams producing these things, very much like a television series or something. So you just don't expect the same quality. Now the other thing, um, usually when you put slides up, like people automatically start reading. But the thing that I'm going to put out there with some of these free services, you need to be careful in terms of what you're giving away. Because like we've already found out, even if you were in the last session, our data is being pulled all the time. And there's a few things even in this user agreement, say for, um, for Anchor in particular, that says things like that second line down where it's like, you understand and agree that the services may retain server copies of your user content even if it's been removed or deleted. And so it's stuff like, essentially, I, again, I'm not a lawyer, but when I read this terminology, the first thing it tells me is you retain all the rights of your ownership, but then they proceed to tell me why they retain, return all the, the rights of anything that I create and put on their platform. So if you're using a free software, like understand what you're getting into. They might be able to take your content and reuse it or repurpose it or, or whatever it is. So you have to understand the terms that you're using. So just if you go in the route of free, proceed with caution. That's all I'm saying. Now, in terms of the actual equipment and setup, there's lots of different ways to do this. And the big argument usually is software versus hardware. Now, there'll be a lot, a lot of people that will make a big argument for a software-based system. And what this means is you typically have a microphone, and in some fashion or another, it's going into your computer and being recorded by actual software on your computer. It might be something like Audacity, or GarageBand, or a million other different softwares. I personally do not care to do it that way, and there's a few reasons. One is you can get a lot of technical feedback noise and different things from the actual device itself. If you have a bad ground, like if you're plugged into something that's not a stable connection, like you can get that little like, and you're like, what is that sound? It's insane. Um, other things that can happen is that you can potentially lose episodes. So I, had, uh, I was testing out a service, I was testing out Zencaster for the first time. Zencaster is neat because it has two channels. It records your guest from their end and you from your end. And then it merges it and it has all these really neat tools that you're able to edit it quickly and easy and seamlessly online. Within my first three interviews, I lost one due to technical difficulties. And fortunately, I was using hardware to back it up because I was basically just testing the service out to see if it was something I could recommend to my clients. And any chance of losing the episode, I just don't have room for. Some of the people that I'm interviewing, they don't have time to reschedule an interview. I couldn't imagine if I, some of the guests that I've had to go, oh, hey, by the way, that got deleted. Can we do it again? I, I don't have room for that. And so hardware for me is a very solid standby. For the digital recorders that I've been using, I've recorded over 300 episodes. I've never lost one ever. I've never had one compromise, um, anything like that. And so again, for me personally, this is why I'm convicted in this manner. You might blatantly disagree, and you know what? That's okay. 
Like, I'm not offended, you do your thing. And if it's working for you, great. But for me, I'm gonna make a big argument for the hardware. Now, the one that you see up here is the Zoom H6. There's a bunch of different ones. And what I'll show you at the end of this presentation is I, I have this printout one page list that I'm gonna give you access to. Um, you don't even have to trade me anything for it, it's just free. And it's a full list of like everything that I would recommend. But this one in particular is the one that I've upgraded to. I had some other ones for a while, and I like this a lot for some different things. Like you can see um, those kind of circular holes on the side of it it's for an XLR cable, so you can plug a microphone directly into it, which will give it a better sound. It's got individual volume knobs on the top, like you can decide which things are gonna record. You can record up to four things at once, four people at once. Um, there's the microphone up on the top, so if you're just like live in person, you can do it that way with the condenser mics if you need to. The blue thing allows you to switch off that microphone and add other inputs if you need it. And then it does some other fancy stuff like mix minus, which basically is, uh, without getting super technical, it's a way if you have a guest, say you're listening to or interviewing on Skype, to have them hear you but not get their own volume sent back to them. Because when that happens, it creates this like echo of death and it sounds terrible on the recording and you don't wanna do it. So this has been a really, really great device for me. And so this would be one piece of the entire setup. This is kind of the backbone. It's what everything gets recorded to. Now beyond that, you have microphones. Like I have one sitting right here next to me. I'm talking to this one, this little lav, and then I, got, I have a, lav, or a wireless microphone on me right now. There's a million different microphones that you can use and a ton of them are fantastic. Now, I'm kind of old school in the sense of I just use my SM Shure, or my Shure SM58. This is a classic stage mic. If you've gone to any concert at all, like the majority of the bands are using an SM58. It's a $100 microphone. Um, for me, it has a really great mid-range sound because I'm, I have a little bit of a deeper voice and I have a tendency of mumbling. So whereas some of these higher end microphones, like you might look at something, say, like the, um, another fancy getting technical, a Shure SM7B uh, is the same one that, say, someone like Joe Rogan uses. That has a little bit more of what people in the audio industry might consider a muddy sound or a darker sound. That might not mesh well, super well with my voice, even though it's a better $400 microphone. And so there's stuff all over the place. I just saw somebody the other day using uh, an Audio Technica, I think it's like the 2100, and it has an XLR input, so it can plug into the digital recorder, or a USB input, and it can plug straight into your computer. Again, there's a lot of options. This is the one that just works best for me. I like it, I've had it since I was a musician, and I've used it for probably over 10 years now, and I've, I've never had an issue with it. Um, again, depending on where you are, matters and so if you're out in the field this is the audio technica and again all this stuff if you're vigorously taking down notes i, I have a sheet for you so don't worry about it um, but it's the audio technica at i think it's the 8035 and it's the same one that alex bloomberg used on the startup series if you're familiar with that and it's the same type of microphone that you'll often hear in different npr type things and it's when you're out in the field um, it's really long but essentially you just point it at stuff and it captures the audio extremely well. So this is another good one if you're thinking about doing stuff in the field. Um, you get into this really fun realm of preamps and sometimes they're called different things. The blue boxes that you see are actually called mic activators and the thing underneath is a preamp, but essentially they're doing the same thing. With a dynamic microphone, um, this is another part of the conversation that we didn't really talk about a second ago. When you look at microphones, you really, there's a, several different microphones, but the two main kinds that people are using are dynamic or condenser. Condensers sound beautiful if you're in the right setting. Condensers pick up everything. And so you can get real intimate and talk like those weird videos where they touch your head and they whisper to one side or the other. But the problem is it also picks up the dog barking outside and the cars driving by and all this other crazy stuff that goes on because they're like a high fidelity microphone. They're gonna pick up everything. If you creak in your chair, like it's on there for sure. And so most of us don't have like actual legitimate studios that we're recording our podcasts in. And so for me, that's where a dynamic microphone like the Shures that I've recommended and some of these other ones um, come in better because they're more directional. They're a little more durable. You can just control the sound a lot more. But the problem with them is that they're naturally quieter. 
And so what I mean then is you have to turn up the gain or the volume on your source really high in order to get a decent sound. This is the solution to that. And so these are two devices that I own both of them and I like a lot. The first one is dead simple. You can't screw it up. It's a cloud lifter. And you literally plug your microphone in one side and then you plug the other side into either your digital recorder, your mixer board, or whatever it might be. And it's going to naturally boost up the sound of your microphone so you're not ramming the, the volume all the way to 11. The second one is a little more fancy. And so if you have a technical edge, it might be something that you're interested in. It's a DBX-286. And the cool thing about that one is it has a bunch of other knobs, and those other knobs do things. Like uh, there's terminology you might hear like a gate. And so sometimes when you're recording, as I'm talking, hear that? Maybe you don't because you're not used to it. Hear the, the air conditioner? That gets picked up. But if I have a gate on, it kills sound below a certain decibel level. So as long as my voice stays above a certain decibel level, you can cut it out automatically. Otherwise, you're cleaning it up in the, after the fact when you're editing, and that becomes a pain in the butt. And it does a lot of other really neat features like that to enhance the sound right up front to save you a ton of time in editing later. Um, the audio interface or a mixer is, think of it essentially as the way to get the sound from the microphone into the computer. And so eventually you're going to need to get it there. If you're talking to your guest, um, if you're doing a Skype interview or whatever it might be, there's a lot of different ways to handle this. For about four years, I used a mixer board like that. And I ran that mix minus thing that I talked about, where the computer would send the guest's audio into my mixer, and then the mixer would send my audio back to the computer so my guest could hear me. After about four years, I think my mixer just got too dusty and it started to have a bad electrical sound. And so I replaced it with the thing up in the corner, the red one. That's a, a Focusrite Scarlett 292. And this is a digital interface that basically allows you to plug an XLR cable, which is like a true mic cable, into that. And then it converts it into your computer for you via a USB cable. And it's really simple. It has a super small footprint on the desk, which I liked a lot. I wanted to free up desk space. And so that's been a great solution. And the last one, and this is a setup that I haven't seen that often, um, was going back to the Zoom. The Zoom actually works as a digital interface too. You can plug it into your computer, plug your microphone straight into the Zoom, and the computer talks to it, and it's like, oh, hey, I know it's a microphone. That's cool. That works. I'm going to listen to you. Um, the neat thing is, without needing the mixer board and all of those crazy knobs, you can set up the exact same mix minus that I was talking about with a Zoom. And so all of a sudden, I basically replaced that entire mixer board and a variety of other things with a single device, and that's been really helpful too. <clears throat> You need a way to listen back uh, to your mix. You need a, listen, a, a way to listen to people. The, the only advice, I, I don't have huge opinions on this. Uh, there's people that definitely feel much more strongly about the best headphones ever and the best monitors ever than I do. I kind of don't care, as long as you can hear it and as long as it sounds good. The big thing is if you are on a budget and you have to choose, hands down, pick headphones. The reason you want to do that is because when you're interviewing the guest, if you have your, your microphone and they're coming through the speakers, if they get picked up, if their voice gets picked up on your microphone, all of a sudden they're bleeding over into your track. And so let's say I'm talking and all of a sudden somebody over here is, oh, oh, starts coughing. It's going to be on my track and it's going to be a pain in the butt to edit that out after the fact. So when you have headphones, it keeps that sound contained. Secondly, the majority of people are listening to podcasts on headphones, and so it's a nice true way to hear back what they're actually going to hear when you get into the editing process. If you have the budget, go beyond that and grab yourself some decent studio monitors. These, both of these things are better than what you'd find at a local store. Um, the ones, the, the headphones in particular, these are just sort of uh, audio journalism radio standard, they're the Sonys. And then the, um, I just have the Mackies. There's a CR series, there's an MX series, there's a Yamaha series that's pretty good. And they're, the headphones are like $80 headphones. The speakers are, I think I paid 100 or 150 for mine. Um, and they've done the, jun, d d d done the job excellently. Other stuff you want to consider. Pop filters and stands, again, it doesn't matter a whole lot. Pop filter, like say that little fuzzball thing would just go on the top of this. I have one on this lav right here and it just, for things like aggressive sounds like 
or t -t -t -t. so you're not doing that, so you're not spitting all over the microphone uh, with those kind of things. It's gonna keep it clean. And so there's the kind that get placed right in front of it, there's the kind that go over top of it. It doesn't matter, it's preference. Um, otherwise, stands are just, how is, how is the microphone being held? This is on this little bendy arm thing. I had a stand on my desk for a super long time. I just switched over to a boom arm like this because I wanted to move it out of the way. Um, so again, just preference, it doesn't matter. They sell the stand right there, that's a $100 boom stand. I bought mine for like 15 bucks. It's a cheap knockoff version, but so far it's doing the job, so I don't care a whole lot. Um, beyond that, this is where it gets a little more uh, kind of a pain in the butt. You need power and cables. And so essentially all you need is, you, you need to protect your equipment. You just want some sort of decent surge protector. But I'm gonna point out that Furman makes actual surge protectors that are designed for audio. And so a lot of their versions not only will condition the power, so it's if, in case there's a surge, in case there's a big electrical blast or something, it's not gonna fry all your equipment, but it's also gonna filter out some of those uh, kind of obnoxious noises that can happen technically with those. And then cables, there's a million cables. We got quarter inch cables, we've got 3.5 cables, we got quarter inch two 3.5 cables, we got XLR cables, that can be very overwhelming. And and honestly, it 100% depends on your setup, so there's no possible way that I can tell you what to get. Um, I can talk to you about them once you get them or what you might need if you knew the rest of those main pieces of your setup, um, but it's completely dependent on what you're doing. So that's equipment. And again, this is a, just a very technical talk. Um, this I'm gonna talk a little bit now about, say, our production and the software and the tools that you might wanna consider. Just like equipment, there's a million different softwares that do a million things differently. There's, I haven't found a single project management software that does everything I want it to. I don't think anyone in the history of the world has. And so it's like, you just deal with the best what you can with what you've got. For audio editing, there's a lot of different things. Sometimes these are commonly referred to as a DAW. It's a digital audio workshop. And so I just use Audacity. It's free. Some people will scoff at me for that. Um, there's, Audacity gets kind of a bad rap in different circles, but it does everything I need it to. I've never had an issue. I have another person on my team who will use, um, what is he? He's using Logic, and so he's using Logic Pro. I have another person on my team that uses Adobe Audition. It just depends on your preference. The only piece of advice I would give you is find something that you like and stick with it because then you get to learn the nuances, you get to learn the shortcuts. It's just like if you happen to be a developer or anything, you just pick a program and stick with it and then you'll just become much more proficient at it. You'll find out the things that it doesn't do well, the things that it does do well, etc. Additional tools, some of these are really good for beginners. Um, Levelator is a tool that's like, the development on it's been discontinued for quite a while, I think since like 2014 maybe. But essentially what it does is it takes that problem I gave you earlier about my volume being really, really quiet and my, the host's volume being really loud. It takes it and it does a variety of fun effects that I won't get into, but it just makes it even. And so it doesn't matter if somebody's recording at this level and the other person's recording at this level, It'll take it and it'll go, okay, we're gonna fix it. And it just makes it even so it's a consistent listen for whoever the person is and it does it automatically. It's not gonna give you the most perfect sound in the world, like you can get nitpicky after a while once you're working in audio, but it was a great solution for me for probably the first like year or two that I was podcasting. Audiophonic is a software as well. This one's a paid, uh, I, they might have a free version, but otherwise it's paid. And it does a lot of the same things. It just basically automatically makes your audio sound good. Um, and the last one there with that weird creature on it is the ID3 tag editor. And so this is kind of like SEO for a uh, MP3 file. And what it'll do is it'll tag it. So anytime um, you have those things show up in your players where it's like, this is the artist, this is the album, this is the date it was recorded. That's all embedded on there via an ID3 tag editor. Some of the audio software does it automatically. I just use this one because it allows you to add in cover art as well and different things. So like my actual podcast cover art will show up if anybody downloads one of my episodes. And it's a nice convenient way to work with it. Hosting. The podcast has to live somewhere. That media file, just like your website, you're probably using some host in order. Maybe it was one of the hosts that are sponsoring us this weekend. Um, it, the file itself has to live somewhere. And so some people are like, can I just put it on my host, like my wordpress.com? No, don't do that, it'll break. <laughs> like, I, when I did my first podcast, I intentionally was like, okay, how long until I can explode this shared server? 
And I think I was on Bluehost at the time, and I got to about episode 11, and all of a sudden we hit this spike because we just joined a, a podcast network and we got a lot of traffic, and my podcast went down, and my website went down, and I'm pretty sure some adjacent websites went down, and I'm like, okay, this is about the max that we can do. I need to get a server now. And so these are dedicated specifically for audio files. And so Blueberry is awesome, Lipson is awesome, Simplecast is awesome. I use all three for different reasons. And again, pick something you like, pick something you feel good about. If you had to, Blueberry and Lipson are definitely the most dependable. They've been around the longest. I, I know uh, the CEO of Blueberry and he's great if you care about statistics, if, you, if it matters, like if you're really worried about sponsorships and you need accurate numbers, Blueberry's awesome for that, but really all three of these uh, brands are great. Okay, this is again preference. You so, you're, will need to live somewhere as well. So the MP3 file lives on the media host and then it gets distributed from there, like it's the central source and then iTunes will link into it and all these other things will tap into that original source. Usually you run that through your website. Your website will create what's called an RSS feed and it feeds iTunes and all the other things of, hey, this is my podcast, listen to my podcast, and that's how you get that automatic updating every single time, it's because of your RSS feed. This is, again, just preference. There's a lot of really great hosts out there, there's a lot of really great platforms. I normally, just to whip up a fast site, will use WordPress. I'm typically building on Genesis and I'm doing whatever tweaks that I want to it. SiteGround is who I personally use for my host, but again, I, I would fully back a lot of the different hosts that are out there. PowerPress is the plugin that lets me sort of create the, pod, or the podcast on my website. Or Seriously Simple Podcasting is another plugin that allows me to create the podcast on my website. And so these are just one round of tools that are possible to, to put out there to use. Now in terms of communication, you gotta think about it. If you're running with a team, you wanna talk to your team that's making the podcast. My team works remote. People are scattered across the US. Nobody's in the same time zone. Um, you might need to communicate with your guest. Uh, there's a variety of things. Hopefully these are familiar to you. Slack is great for just internal communication. For ongoing conversations, um, you can categorize it. It's a, just a really, really excellent tool if you're doing any sort of team work. We do not email on my team. We talk via Slack. The second thing is that I'm using Basecamp. Basecamp is also our project management software that I'll get into in a second. But there's communication possibility on there. So if we have a question about a particular to-do or a particular task, we just keep it internal right there on Basecamp. So it's simple. It's like big ideas or Slack. Basecamp is for very specifics. And then the last thing I use, um, you might have your own CRM, which is like a, I don't even remember all the acronyms. It's just to keep track of the people you're talking to. And Streak integrates straight into Gmail. I like it because it replaces things like Boomerang, like it allows you to send emails later. So I can do a bunch of work late at night and then schedule my emails to go out the next morning. So my clients are like, wow, he's up at 5 a.m. Look at him go. Um, I can do other stuff like uh, snooze, and so if I'm pursuing somebody, like if I got a really good conversation going, it's easy to forget about that email. I can snooze it. So if they don't email me back, it'll pop back up in a week or in two weeks. And all this is just based straight out of my Gmail. And I use it to communicate with, like our, say, our clients, and I use it to communicate with people that have been on our podcast to let them know what's going on, that type of thing. So those have been really, really helpful in my world. But again, there's a million. There's a million choices. Project management, there's a lot here too. I used Trello for a long time. Um, Trello's a really great free option. But then we just got to a point where the, the type of work that we're doing, we needed something a little more robust and Basecamp was a really great solution for us. Um, other ones I've used, Asana can work really, really well. I know teams that function totally on Asana. Um, and so it just pick, pick your poison and, and run with it. So in terms of next steps uh, for you, this is where you can find that cheat sheet. And the cheat sheet will be way easier than all of the information that I just spewed upon you today. And it's a full list of everything from each one of those categories that I talked about in all relevant links. Um, you can just go to my website, jefflarge.com forward slash thanks. That's it. And it's right there. 
Below the download, below the little link, is if you want to sign up for my newsletter. Um, again, I, I was talking about this with some friends yesterday. I get really irritated when I have to trade my email for the thing that I want. And so you have the option. I'm running a test on you guys today that if you want to sign up for my newsletter, go ahead. And if you don't, just take the thing and leave. And I hope you have a good life. Beyond that, if you want more help, if you want more help than beyond just that print off, Equipment for Podcasting is a site that I built because I got sick of answering the question, what equipment is good? And so that just sends you through a nine email series of exactly what I would do, a lot of what I talked about today. And then the second one is the podcast about podcasting. Very meta, I know. Um, but I just take each episode answers one question about podcasting. And so I'm typically either getting stuff from my clients, I'm getting stuff I found on Quora, we've dug through a lot of Amazon book reviews, and we're just answering the questions that people have. If you have a question, ask, and I will gladly make an episode about it, because that's just all it is every week. And so again, I run Come Alive Creative. My name is Jeff. I know we're going to lunch. I think I have like a minute or two for questions, but otherwise, happy to answer and help in any way I can. Shoot. Are you talking like bumpers? Yeah. Okay. Um, the question was, should podcasts have bumpers, essentially, that, that standard tag? I think it's 100% preference. Uh, we have been conditioned to think that there's always the bumper. There's a lot of people that will sell, I'll create your bumper for $5 on Fiverr type of thing. And sometimes they work and sometimes they're not necessary. It really depends on the format. I personally am moving more away from, there's, there's, I guess two trains of thought. One is consistency. People like consistency. And so having a podcast go out at the same time every week is important. Having the intro, uh, depending on what it says, can be important that, that music will often trigger a sensor because we're sensory people. And so it'll trigger that. But on the other hand, from an artistic standpoint, I like podcasts that are starting to play and that might open with a quote and a story and then go into the bumper or whatever it might be. So. I say, I, I think you should just do whatever it fits best. Question in the back. Hey, um, Travis, would you recommend any streaming hosting options for the file itself? Like, I, I use archive.org. Um, are there other options, and are they reliable enough to use? Unfortunately, I don't know of any that I can recommend. The question was, um, are there free hosting options for the media files themselves? I don't know of any. Um, it's one of those things that you'll probably need to bite the bullet on. You can do things like some, some companies will allow you to uh, post a certain amount for free, but I can tell you, say with something like SoundCloud's a popular one that will come up for this conversation. I don't recommend using them uh, just because they've run into a variety of financial issues. They've laid off a ton of people. If anybody's kind of followed their story. And the problem is when you, lose control. It's the argument between like, do you control your content or do you put it out on a third party? Uh, there's a thing I just saw, I just posted online the other day on Twitter where YouTube was randomly selecting people to auto create thumbnails for their videos. And somebody was like, YouTube, why is my thumbnail different? And then YouTube's like, well, we randomly decided that we're going to do this thing. And technically they can because they're controlling that content, but that's sort of the issue you run into. And if you create your RSS feed or the thing that tells like iTunes, this is my podcast on someone else's platform, all of a sudden, if that changes, if their policies change, if they die, like, oops, sorry, you're kind of screwed. Like there's not really a nice way to put that. Like you're in trouble. Whereas if you retain it, if you are on a dedicated host that's filtered through your own website, you remove all those variables that you have to worry about. Uh, we'll go one more, and then we're going to have to call it. And then again, I'm going to lunch. I'm going to eat food, and you can ask me whatever you want. Yes? All right. My podcast is hosted on SoundCloud. Let's say I wanted to migrate. Have you ever migrated hosts? And if you have, yep. do you have any tips? Um, the big thing is it helps. It, so the question was, he's on SoundCloud, and then he just got scared by the advice I gave him. <laughs> and now he wants to run, which is not a bad idea. And so 
to do that, pick a host that's knowledgeable. Um, so say somebody like Blueberry could easily walk you through the steps of that, but essentially very, very similar to like a website. If you have a page that no longer exists and you need to do a, uh, whatever, a 301 redirect, in order to not lose that clout and that traffic and things, you can do that with your RSS feed. We had one that recently, um, for a client of ours that we had to migrate over from SoundCloud, they had, actually, I lied. Uh, they were on SoundCloud, but they had their RSS feed set up specifically through Blueberry and not their own website. And we built the website, wanted to take control of that RSS feed, and Blueberry helped us or apply a 301 redirect. So all of, they had like, I don't even know, they were getting like 10,000 listeners per episode type of a thing, and we don't want to lose that traffic. If you just kill the RSS, all of a sudden all your subscribers are gone. But when you do a proper migration like you're talking about, then it helps in that capacity. So. All right, again, I'm available all day, and I hope you have a great lunch. Thanks.